Hello, everyone. We are now cutting into the drinking time. So the sooner you sit down, the faster we get to that part. I would like to invite my panel to please come up and maybe sit in the order, skip at the far end, and then Adam, and then Tara, and then Alondra at this end. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, welcome to our wrap-up session. Um, my panel had the hardest job of anyone here because we have to give the big picture from everything we've heard today, from everything about making it possible, making it normative, uh, rewarding it, and um, then requiring it, and trying to come up with some ideas uh, for moving us forward. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marcia McNutt. I'm president of the National Academy of Sciences. It's a pleasure to have you all here for this important meeting. Um, by way of background, how I got involved in this whole topic uh, goes back to the year 2013 when I became Editor-in-Chief of Science. That was the year after Glenn Begley published his paper that was like a shot heard around the world on the fact that um, so much research in cancer biology was irreproducible uh, at his organization, which was Amgen. So as soon as I got to science, all the editors at Science were very concerned about that and very much wanted to focus on things that they could do in order to improve the situation for the benefit of the reputation of science. And so I put in a short proposal to the Arnold Foundation, and they were so wonderful to fund me to hold a series of three, or I think it was four workshops on different aspects of it, you know, um, uh, open access on things like um, data availability, um, code availability, and um, materials. Um, one of the biggest outcomes to come out of that was the top standards, because at our second workshop, I teamed up with Brian, and he held that workshop down at COS in uh, Charlottesville, and that was probably the most lasting impact from that series. So I, I started working with Brian at that time and then joined the board of COS. So my distinguished panel here, um, on the far end is Dr. Skip Lupia. Skip is the Gerald R. Ford Distinguished Professor, um, University Professor of Political Science at uh, University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Adam Russell is next to him, and he's the director of the AI division in the Information Sciences Institute at USC. Then we have Tara Schwetz, who's the acting principal deputy director at the National Institutes of Health. And then, of course, Alondra Nelson here, who's the Harold F. Linder Professor uh, Institute, Harold F. Linder Professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies, um, which is uh, associated with Princeton. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> All right. Um, and Princeton, but not at Princeton. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, in Princeton, in Princeton. And of course, uh, Alondra is well known uh, around here because she was the uh, former acting director at OSTP. So, Skip, the floor is yours. Thank you. More than we know. More than we know. So we're here to celebrate the incredible accomplishments of the Center for Open Science. The Center for Open Science has changed the world. It has changed what is possible, it has changed what is feasible, and it has changed what is done. And it's supported by all of you. It's a great moment. Ten years ago, the idea of open science was still seen as much of a, more of a fringe in most parts of academia. But it was an important fringe, because what has always been at stake in the quest for more open science is the public value of science itself. The public value of science. We know that science has great potential to create value for the public. It has the potential to foster the next revolutionary technological advance. It has the potential to plant the seeds for the next life-saving vaccine. 
It has the potential to help people all over the world who depend on science for the next policy intervention or the next medical intervention that can improve quality of life for people and save lives. But the extent to which the potential of science to do these things, it's, the extent of that potential, is still an open question. And it exists in an era of uncertainty and open questions about science. In an era of multiple truths, right, there are questions about who can be trusted. And in many places, those questions extend to science, whose very credibility and legitimacy are under question. And it's not just politics, because there are varying levels of awareness that scholarly incentives have created ecosystems that mass-produced false positive claims and sold them to other researchers and to the public as being valid scientific claims. The Center for Open Science led a vanguard of people in communities who knew that we could do better. In 10 years, they built infrastructure, created focal points, and empowered communities through an approach to open science that's accessible, scalable, and incentive compatible. Thanks to this work, researchers all over the planet can engage in more credible and legitimate research practices. It's an incredible thing, and it's thanks to all of you. But the success matters more than we might know. Right? And to get a sense of the scale of what you have accomplished, I'd like to raise a question. Who are the beneficiaries of open science? So some of the beneficiaries of open science are easy to see. They're in this room. But most of them are invisible to us. Most of them are invisible to us. Think about it for a second. Think about all the people who've never been to the National Academy of Sciences. Randomly select any number you choose. What do they look like? What are their days like? What are their concerns like? Think about the university or institution at which you work. Think about all the people who've never stepped foot there. What do they look like? What are their lives like? What are their concerns? You can think of people who've never stepped on any university campus or have never met a researcher. Think about that population. Randomly select from them. What do they care about? What are they concerned about? What do they need to get them through the day? While these people are invisible, to many parts of the scientific establishment, they're not invisible. They're part of communities, and they have families. And every single seemingly invisible person deserves the very best that the scientific community can give them. And the heroes in this room are a big part of giving it to them. Right? They are making open science accessible. They are making open science scalable and they're making it meaningful. And how have they done it? Well, you've seen it, right? You're part of it. How do you bring something from the fringe to the center, right? It's through perseverance. It's through evidence-based strategy. But I think the key ingredient that we can all see but no one's talked about is that it's fundamentally other-regarding. It's fundamentally other-regarding. In science, it can be so easy to make it about us. But at the Center for Open Science, it is so clearly about the people we serve and how to do it better. It's an incredible accomplishment. So it doesn't matter. Because what matters is today and what we do tomorrow and how we build on this. So that's up to the people in this room and everybody we connect to. The world, I would argue, needs more reliable science, more now than ever before particularly for all the people who can benefit it from we can't see. So let's get to that exercise, because the value of it is more than we know. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. I said I wasn't going to cry. Um, OK. Uh, <laughs> You ever, you ever have deja vu? Um, I'm having deja vu right now uh, because every time Brian asks me to give a talk, I end up having surgery just before that. <laughs> so in 2019, in MetaScience, I, was, I had my knee done, and now here I am with my bionic arm. Not, not DARPA approved. Uh, darn it. Couldn't get one. I know, right? It wouldn't be great uh, as I just fly off. 
Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> not yet. I'm not, and I can, never, I can no longer speak for upper age. Uh, more on that in a moment. Um, but I also bring that up so that, Brian, you know that my injury is my arm and not that I'm having a stroke when I say this word UDA. UDA, right? So uh, Department of Defense, they use this term UDA, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And it's called an UDA loop. And uh, Colonel John Boyd from the Air Force proposed this as basically the person with the tightest OODA loop wins because they can adjust as fast as they need to. A good OODA loop allows you to amplify what's working and allows you to inhibit what's not. And I think we are in too slow of an OODA loop. And I think a key mechanism to speeding up that OODA loop is open science. Uh, one example, uh, in 2005, a, a Nature had an amazing article about how trust enhances, um, or sorry, oxytocin enhances trust in humans. Uh, and that is big if true, to quote Tom Khalil. So when I was at ARPA, I, I ARPA, we stood up a program on this question of can we measure trust, given that. It came out of nature. It was, you know, it was a perfect example of everything I would argue that's essentially wrong. Right? It's a novel uh, uh, claim. There was no open data. There was no ability to actually verify this stuff. Uh, so I knew by 2010 that that was probably not true. And it took until 2014 for my program to have a null result, essentially arguing that published. Nine years is too long as an OODA loop. Period. Um, so I ended up talking to Brian here briefly. Uh, y'all can, you all can just leave or listen in if you want, but Brian. <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, we sort of have been on this, on this journey. Uh, you know, Chrissy mentioned today she's been writing about the reproducibility problem since, you know, since it started. I was living it, right, in 2008, 2009. Um, so early on, even before Center of Open Science stood up, uh, you know, you were an inspiration. Uh, you allowed me to say I wasn't crazy, that I should force my performers. And force is the operative term, by the way, uh, to pre-register. They had to make predictions. Uh, they had to share data. We ran replications. People were like, well, if we pre-register, what happens if we find stuff we didn't think we'd find? Well, that's why we're going to replicate. <laughs> then it's a real fact. Uh, and then when I got to DARPA, um, you know, you, you really provided some, some amazing uh, capabilities, I would argue, in the sense of uh, consulting. Right? You really helped sort of, I think, inform uh, decisions we could make. Uh, you helped uh, us do better, I think, uh, in, in our program designs. Uh, and then ultimately, you had the infrastructure uh, when you were up there that allowed me to use pre-registration, allowed me uh, to do data sharing, uh, and, and ultimately, um, hopefully, even engage on some of the, the more crazy stuff, which I'll talk about in just a moment as well. Uh, then you proved your ability to equip us. Uh, so when we were worried about computational reproducibility, as we all should be in increasing age of machine learning and opaque AI analyses, uh, you know, you actually developed a tool called the Repro Rubric that we were able to use in our program, and it's still there, I think, reprorubric.com. Shout out to Brandon. Uh, so you equipped us, and then you strategically positioned us as well by using workshops to help think about how do we get social scientists to actually make predictions? How do we bring forecasting as a way to improve our ability, our OODA loop? Um, and then how do we even think about like AI and reproducibility, where there's going to be this challenge? And where, by the way, it's not obvious that you want everything open in this area, right, of machine learning AI. It's not clear to me that just making it freely available is the answer. Um, you also helped with innovation, right? Uh, so we tried registered reports on one of our AI exploration. We moved too fast. It didn't work. But we were willing to sort of take that risk. Uh, you ran a prediction market on our, on our experiments. Turns out social scientists are very bad at predicting complex experiments. That's fine. Now we know. Our OODA loop is tight. And then finally, the SCORE program, I did my best to break the Center for Open Science with this program. Uh, and instead, I ended up broken. But yeah, I mean, just in inc incredible effort. That teaches me, right? Yeah. Um, but if you, you don't remember, the SCORE program was really an ability to run like an unprecedented number of, of replications to build tools to help us understand. Because there are decision makers who need this stuff today. Uh, and the stuff that's published cannot be trusted. Uh, for the most part, certainly when it comes to making life or death decisions. So uh, when I got to ARPA-H uh, in, in May, courtesy of Dr. Tara Schwetz, by the way, who actually is the godmother of ARPA-H, stood this thing up almost by herself, uh, I was excited to have that opportunity, as, as Phil was talking about, to, to build an ARPA from the ground up to bake that meta-science in. Um, you know, we had everything. Someone mentioned Paul Smaldino's study on, uh, you know, the natural selection of of a bad science, we ran simulations on ways to counter that. We were going to do modified funding lotteries. We had an opportunity to, to bring you know, f uh, forecasting markets to peer review. Uh, we registered reports to the very beginning. Why aren't we doing that more often? Even an ARPA can do that. Uh, and then ultimately, I'm really interested in sort of collective intelligence. Let's not presume that even in a hyper-empowered place like the program manager at ARPA knows everything. And there's lots of signal out there to be tapped. Uh, I am no longer at ARPA-H. I don't know where that is at this point, um, to be honest. Uh, but I was very, very excited, and you were you and Center for Open Science and the, the awesome uh, community that you built were the first people I turned to to try to bake that in. And I hope it will be baked in, to be honest, uh, moving forward. So all of this is in pursuit of this tighter OODA loop, and I think we can get there, keep on going on. And I'm going to end with, very briefly, 
you know, uh, it's a hall of science, so why not end with a prayer? A, a prayer of relief that you were there and that, that, that you had people who were uh, smart enough to fund you in advance so you could be there. Uh, a prayer of gratitude that you are still here. Uh, and then also a prayer of hope that you remain here and that the, the, the thing that you have started, all of you, uh, continues forward. Uh, and I will be there to help. Just let me know. After you, you know, I mean, the two of those. Um, <laughs> but it's true. Actually, one thing he left out of that was Adam uh, and I sort of geeked out and bonded. And I think half the reason I was able to convince him to come help me stand up ARPA H was because we talked about all of those, well, a lot of those things anyway that, that he just mentioned, which is um, a potential um, opportunity to, to leverage, um, hopefully not just at ARPA H, and maybe we could adopt some of those things at, at NIH as well, and we've been having those conversations. Um, but Brian and I were actually talking earlier uh, today, too, um, about um, you know just 10 years ago and, and, and when I, at least I was first engaged with the Center for Open Science. Um, and this was back uh, you know, in 2013, 2014. NIH was also launching a bunch of uh, rigor and reproducibility efforts. We had an initiative that we were launching, and, and we were working closely with the Center for Open Science as they were getting uh, up and running and, and sort of seeing what they were doing. And I know I went out to Charlottesville a couple times uh, to sort of, you know, uh, just to get some new ideas and inspiration. and, and you know, some of the things that we did at the time um, have, have, I think, um, have been able to, to stand the test of time uh, for the last 10 years or so, um, and, and hopefully uh, can continue to iterate and to develop more. And so that includes things like, you know, clarifying what we mean by rigor and reproducibility and transparency in both our grant application process as well as, um, you know, review criteria. We partnered with publishers, and we were talking about that today, on, on developing some principles and guidelines for publishing preclinical research. Um, we developed a bunch of training. Um, but fast forward to um, you know, something that, that, that kind of, uh, that, said that kind of uh, harkened back to one of the things I was gonna mention, which is during the pandemic, which you know, occupied a ton of our time at NIH, um, for, for good reason. We had a lot of work to do to try to move us beyond this um, public health emergency. But it reminded us, I think, in a really uh, uh, unfortunate, unique way um, of the importance that we had to share information and data in real time. Um, and this is where that sort of potential, I think, that, that Skiff mentioned uh, helped to shift into reality. Uh, it, you know, having those real-time data helped inform decision-making, guide scientific progress, um, just, just to run through some facts and figures that at least we have on our side, and I'm sure it's, it's much bigger overall, but you know, the scientific community shared immediate access to m over 2.5 million uh, genomic sequences of SARS-CoV-2, thousands of protein structures uh, for SARS-CoV-2, hundreds of reagents for, uh, the, across the biomedical research community, billions, at least, at le this is only in one of the data sets that we have, the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C, um, almost 10 billion uh, rows of clinical data that we have through there. Um, and of course, the final outputs of all these things, right, are, are over 150,000 papers that were published. And all of that, you know, kind of helped to enable the overall response to, to the COVID vaccine, uh, or excuse me, the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic. Um, but I also wanted to touch on a few things, just because they've come up uh, in the various, some of the various sessions that I, I've seen today, uh, since I'm, I'm, I'm uh, representing the government perspective, I guess, on this panel, filled by former government folks. Um, but, but, you know, they're sort of, you know, thinking about two main components of, of open science, um, and that's it's data sharing and public access. And I, I think as hopefully most of you know, uh, 2023 um, is the year of open science, according to OSTP. Um, and it's, it's a, you could, you could, you know, Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's been something that I think has been a priority for NIH, at least, for, for quite a while. And, and we've been hard at work refining some of our policies that we have, are now in the process of, of putting into place. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I think scientific data sharing. 
you know, because I think probably we're all in this room for a reason. Um, so I think we can probably safely say that we all agree that data sharing uh, accelerates discovery, enhances rigor and reproducibility, and helps support that transparency that's so important. Um, and NIH, we undertook a multi-year process. It was five years, actually, <laughs> that we've, we took to really work with the community, engage the community, develop and implement our data management and sharing uh, policy that just went into place in January. Um, and this requires researchers to do three things. First, they got to develop a plan, and presumably a budget, uh, for how to actually share their data and preserve it. Uh, to submit that plan when they are applying for funding, and then to comply with the plan. So hopefully <laughs> fairly simple, um, although we all know the devil's in the details. And um, you know, this is, again, just only been a few months old that it's been an implemented policy. Um, and so we're continuing to work with the community to get extensive feedback um, and engagement, and would appreciate that from, from all of you, for any of you who have had experience with that. Uh, and I will say, we have a really great website that's called sharing.nih.gov that has a ton of information on all these things. Um, the other thing um, is public access, as I've mentioned before. Um, and in, in August of 2022, uh, Dr. Nelson here, and uh, OSTP issued a memo on ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. Now, NIH has sort of long championed this, and, and we're really supportive of this important step. Um, and it, it's really focused on, on three major pillars. So the access to the data, which um, in our case, the data management and sharing policy that we just put out um, covers that. Access to publications, um, having that, um, and, and for NIH funded stuff, that means uh, removing the 12 month embargo that we currently have in place for NIH fund funded publications, and by 2025, having that shift to zero months, so it would be immediate. Um, and, and continue, of course, to, to monitor uh, all the trends and, and, and um, publication fees and, and policies that go along with that. Um, and then uh, also the metadata and persistent identifiers, and that's something that we're still working in development. I mean, we obviously have uh, work. We have a lot of we have PubMed, right? So we 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 have some experience in this, and and we um, we have been working with Orchid ID and, and others to to implement uh, policies uh, to put in place. But I think that there's many more things that we can do there, um, and uh, we've had a lot of listening sessions over the last. Um, well, the last several years, but in particular, April was a busy month um, because we had an RFI that closed a couple weeks ago. We had a listening session, gathered feedback, hopefully from many of you. Um, and I think the take home message that I just wanted to iterate was that we are um, really hoping to continue to push forward some of the policies that we have in place or are planning, um, always looking to think about what the unintended consequences are of those policies. Um, and we operate on such you know, big scale that, um, that what we do, we understand, can have a huge influence. So um, uh, with that, we, we always want to, to hear from the community um, who are actually living and breathing this every single day. So we hopefully will be able to continue to part or partner with the Center for Open Science and, and helping to meet the expectations that we are putting forward. So with that, turn it over to Alondra. <laughs> It was not boring, and it's good to see. And also, Tara was my, my colleague at OSU for a time, so it's great to be back. So good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations to the Center uh, for Open Science for a decade of leadership. In this year, that is also the year of open science um, that has helped to move scholarly communities closer toward our public benefit mission, to underscore what Skip was saying, and has helped to provide transparency, accountability, and rigor, um, and mostly quantitative research um, in particular. So I left government service about two months ago. I no longer feel uh, any obligation to speak on capacity uh, on, the, on behalf of an official capacity or on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, but I think on a panel that's about change agents, I would be remiss to not actually talk about the president as a change agent here. So um, what we were able to do um, in the administration is because the um, you know, the President of the United States is a believer in open science, um, particularly from the perspective of science of cancer research. Um, and uh, when given the opportunity to talk about it, talks about it. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples because I, I think it's really important that people appreciate um, 
how important his role was and, and allowing um, us as Adam and I as former federal um, employees and, and Tara to do the work that we do. So this is a quote from the president from 2016 when he was vice president speaking at the um, American Association for Cancer Research. So he identified the contradictions of a publicly funded research publishing ecosystem um, that had impact as one of its aims but was uneven in the way that it pursued it. And so this is quoting the president. Right now, you work for years to come up with a significant breakthrough. And if you do, you get to publish in a, pap a paper in one of the top journals. For anyone to get access to that publication, they have to pay hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to subscribe. And here's the kicker. That journal owns the data for a year. The taxpayers fund $5 billion a year in cancer research every year. But once it's published, nearly all of that taxpayer-funded research sits behind walls. Tell me how this is moving the process along more rapidly. Then again, in September of, uh, of 2020, on uh, September 12, 2022, speaking on the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's moonshot speech, um, and uh, a few weeks following the OSTP um, uh, updated public access guide to federal agencies, and on the occasion he would introduce Renee Wezergan to the world as his um, appointee for to lead ARPA H, um, the president said this. So this was just a few, you know, not long ago. We don't share enough data and knowledge to bring the urgency we need to find new answers. He talked about how in the past he had talked about um, how federally funded cancer researchers were not sharing their results with their peers and with the public. And then the president continued, we made federally, and he's here invoking um, the, the um, OSTP 2022 memo. We made federally funded cancer research more available to any patient, to any doctor, anywhere for free. And today, as president, we're making sure that transparency applies to all federally funded science beyond just cancer. So um, this has been, you know, so you have a president who's been a change agent here, who's actually been on a journey, on this journey with some of you, I think, coming to an awareness of how important it is for the public service mission of many of our institutions and for much of the research that we do, um, uh, that it be um, uh, shared um, in ways with the public. Um, so while I'm honored to be on a panel with true change agents, um, colleagues I admire, I wanted to take a moment to register the president in that space as well. So if my colleagues have done before me this afternoon, I want to offer a few, re a few reflections. Mine are a bit more provocative. Some of you know me, so you won't be surprised to hear that, um, about what we might do for the future, which is to really celebrate and spur on the Center for Open Science, but to also think about um, uh, what this incredible now infrastructure and networking community might spur in the future. Um, so I offer kind of three things, uh, three sort of categories. One, um, something that's obviously to most of you, but I, I would, um, what I'm trying to do here is to challenge this community to really, I think, um, do more of the narrative change work that got you going around the theme of open science not being a publishing mo model. Um, transformations that promote often open software, privacy pre preserved open data to the extent possible with a you know asterisk for Adam's really important remark about um, machine learning and AI and, and how that changes the dynamic a bit. Open code. These transformations are critical to the culture of inquiry, to research, to discovery. And while these implicate business models, they are themselves um, not business models and indeed have the benefit of being, being able to use, be used for an array of business uses, of, of uses, commercial, not-for-profit, and others. So the revised 2022 public access guidance really highlights the importance of the Americans' public access to uh, taxpayer-supported research. And this is a criteria that can be accomplished in several ways. Um, you, don't, you can uh, use an agent-designated repository. You don't have to pay um, APC fees. And um, you know, I think the hope, and we'll have to, to see how it's implemented by Tara and others, will be that it helps to bring more kind of dynamism and, and flexibility um, in the larger ecosystem that you all help to catalyze and create. Um, so what I'm as offering here, asking here, is a kind of reassertion of and a commitment, a recommitment um, from the open science community to the public mission of open science, to improving the craft of research and its transparency and, account and accountability, while also strengthening scientific integrity, um, but to do it truly in a way that um, offers public benefit and does not um, double down on um, business models, again, going to Skip's really important um, observations at the beginning um, that uh, really constrain access to these broader communities that are invisible to some of us, but not all of us. Second, um, 
uh, open doesn't mean accessible or inclusive. Um, and I think that um, you know, open science communities, open software communities often just assume that because something is open, anyone can come and anyone feels welcome to come. And, you know, I hope that we know, particularly um, those of us who lead organizations, those of us who work in the social sciences, actually just know that's not true. And so while the kind of founding mission and vision of this organization and this community around openness was important, it is not sufficient. Um, and that, um, you know, that work needs to be done to expand um, the institutionalist, uh, institutionalization and success of open science in its next decade is going to have to deal with the fact that all researchers don't feel welcome in the space of open science. And the scale that Adam was gonna, is talking about is going to require um, uh, more participation from more people in the open science ecosystem. Um, for example, you know, a real commitment to providing data and, and ways that are recommended in the 2022 OSTP menu um, memo um, that enhance accessibility to uh, assistive devices by using machine readable research findings and data, not just research findings and data, but research findings and data that we can make available to people who might not have access to them otherwise. Also, um, uh, in the same vein, a deeper commitment to finding ways to include those who may not always be able to bear um, the, the, the work of experimenting by publishing in PLOS. So some of my, you know, I've published in PLOS a few times, and, um, but that was because I was teaching at Yale and I could publish it. You know, there are a lot of people who can't take what seems to be the risk of working in um, experimental journals. And so how do we sort of um, change that sort of calculus for people and how do we help to support that work? Um, I wanted to highlight the work of Dr. Danae Ford Robinson at Microsoft Research, who I hope is a name that's familiar to you. I'm not getting any looks of, of okay, it should be a name that's, that's really familiar to you. She publishes as Danae Ford. Um, I've learned a great deal from her about this very topic. So her work identifies the cognitive and social barriers to participation in online kind of socio-technical ecosystems. In particular, she looks at GitHub communities, she looks at open science and programming communities, open software communities, and she seeks to understand empirically, often um, with experimental research and sometimes with um, behavioral research, why people don't participate in those communities. Um, you know, why people comment on or, you know, um, uh, you know, give the thumbs up to some people's codes and, and not other people's codes and these sorts of things. So um, this is the kind of research, you know, the meta research, the meta science, I think that will give us observations that will help us to be um, more uh, sort of equitable and inclusive um, uh, um, uh, uh, open science communities. Lastly, um, be careful what you wish for. Great success. So successful, in fact, that the transformation of science has been well beyond the field of experimental social science and natural sciences and physical sciences. You have succeeded in establishing open science, but also created new norms for the research enterprise more generally. So I would remind you, uh, those that you don't know, that the 10 year of the Center, anniversary of the Center for Open Science is also the 10 year anniversary of the National Endowment of Humanities um, Open Book uh, Grant Program. So you have had fe fellow travelers um, in this mission for a very long time. And my last kind of challenge or provocation would be to work outside of the space of experimental science, um, uh, RCTs and the like, and to think about how the scale that Adam really reminded us that we you seek and need will require us to work across research communities that are doing um, working in different methods and spaces. Um, the rise and fall of the replic 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 replicability crisis um, has rightly returned our attention to other methods. Um, maybe replication is one goal, but there are other critical goal goals, including transparency, accountability, and the broad benefit and dissemination of research and knowledge to a broad set of audiences. And the caution there is just not to, to have replic replicability be our kind of north star for this work. Um, so just to close, you know, what lies ahead, I think, is a future for the research e ecosystem um, that has been um, much more transformative than I think you all even imagined because you've changed the whole ecosystem, not the kind of particular sector that I think you imagined that you were working with. Um, and, uh, you know, many of the kind of tenets, bylaws, charters of the organizations we're creating, of the organizations we work in and do our work in, um, ask us to do our work in the spirit of the public good. Um, and I would just challenge all of us to continue to think about open science as one of the vehicles um, to, to live out that mission. Thank you.